good to see you all. And um, I wanted to announce, especially for parents, um, just be aware, um, there are uh, sermon worksheets. Um, Noah and Katie printed them out for us. I think they're a great idea, but um, over in the back. Yep, right over there. So if you want to grab some, um, feel free. And uh, hopefully that'll help with the kids paying attention and everything. So um, there is a, a hymn sing today uh, at um, uh, the Vanderplot's house. Uh, we're still looking for a VBS director. Um, and uh, any, oh yeah, today we're having an offering for the mission fund, so be aware of that. That's number six there on the back of your bulletin. And uh, also remember that Ascension Presbytery Virtual Missions Conference is coming up, and there's, um, there's a little uh, sheet in the back on the bulletin board if you want to look at the schedule. It's not on your bulletin, but it is back there on the bulletin board. So any other announcements that we should mention? Yes. Yeah, people have been raving about that book. Um, I think 10 people have recommended it to me. I mean, it's just, yeah, so it's, it's um, and by the way, uh, it's basically the content of a Puritan book, but updated for today. So I just wanna, I just wanna mention that. Um, there is some, some Puritan roots to it, so. Um, yes, Emma. Yes, Gary. I just want to clarify on the hymn sing. We're going to be eating right after church if you're interested. And it says something about 2 o'clock. We probably won't start singing until almost 3. But there's enough food for everyone and there's enough hymn books also. Thanks, Gary. Yes. Uh, I did put the flyer up for the CEF walkathon in the back. It's May 22nd. Uh, you can sign up to walk or sponsor walkers. Good. Walkathon, May 22nd. Anything else? How about um, uh, prayer requests? I have several in front of me. Um, are there any additional that um, has not already been sent out? Yes, please. Go ahead. Um, yes, we'll certainly pray for that. Very good. Um, other, yes. Yes, pray for Andrew surgery on his shoulder. Good. Anything? Yeah. We are, uh, Exceedingly grateful for God's protection. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the house stinks, but that's the worst of it. Yeah. Um, the dryers in the back of the truck will balloon soon. Uh, yeah. The uh, pregnancy center that I uh, work with, um, uh, Promise of Life Network, is the, the broad um, organization. 
about a year ago, we stumbled into a, uh, an international uh, mission <clears throat> through a, a website that we developed called uh, athomeabortionfacts.com, uh, and uh, it has literally exploded. Uh, we've had, over, we've, just this last month, over 700 contacts uh, with women around the world, uh, mostly uh, the African continent, but the uh, Middle East, uh, Europe, that, uh, that we've uh, been helping to connect with local pregnancy centers that uh, are pro-life. Uh, and we've seen a, a huge, huge uh, hmm. response to that. So pray for that and that we could handle it well. Yeah. Good. Yes, Lisa. Um, my, my uncle that we had prayed for that had uh, COVID back in January, he had recovered from that, but since then, this past week, he did die. Um, he, was, mm. he, was, he was ready to go. He was going to be 98 in April, mm. so he had a good long leg, but just yeah. to be with those that are mourning. Yeah. Good. Yes. Let's praise God. Um, because in the midst of my miseries this week, that most of you probably know about, it hit me that uh, according to Paul Tripp, and I believe the scriptures, my kidney stone was God appointed. God appointed the fish, he appointed the vine, and he appointed the worm to eat the vine. So <laughs> Paul Tripp said, if you got a problem with that, you got a problem. So I'm thankful for God's work in me. Good. Good. Um, that reminds me, I wanted to point you to number three on the back of your bulletin. Um, there's a little uh, blurb in there <clears throat> from Sam. Uh, since uh, both Roberta and I, Sam, uh, have hearing aids, which are not um, close to God-given ears, uh, after Sunday, March 7th, we will not be providing an updated prayer uh, request list. Uh, therefore, those who use the prayer list will need to take uh, your own notes for in-service requests. We will continue to send out requests that are emailed to us um, or phoned into us if you don't have email. Um, so, Sam, did you want to add anything to that or is that... That's clear? Good. Okay. Um, anything else? Seeing none, take some time to prepare your heart for worship.
Beloved Church of Christ, please stand as we come before God in worship together. Let's pray together. Our glorious God, you care for the flowers and the birds. Lord, you care for every detail of the cosmos, Lord. How much more, though, do you care for us, your beloved people? You, you know us. You know the hairs on our heads. You know us intimately, Lord. You, you created us. You know what we are made for and how we will have true fulfillment in life. And so, Lord, for all of those reasons and much, much more, we come. We come to worship you and to give thanks to you and to honor you. And Lord, we pray and we, we long, Lord, that you would find even our worship pleasing, Lord, in your sight. We trust in the blood of Christ that covers our worship. We trust in the work of the Spirit within us who also brings our our. Uh, praise to you, Lord, in heaven. And so, Lord, we, we trust in you and we rest on you. You are good. You are God. And we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's hear together from the word of God as he calls us to worship. Uh, First Chronicles 29, 10 through 15. Hear now God's word. Therefore, David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you and of your own have we given you. For we are strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no abiding. Amen. We respond to this word singing together, uh, hymn number 76, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven.
can turn to those inserts in your bulletins as we sing Micah 6 8 and Lord reign in me.
may be seated. As we continue to hear from God's word in Psalm 38, as we're called to confess our sin. Psalm 38, starting in verse 3. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me. My wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. I am utterly bowed down and prostrate all the day I go about mourning. For my sides are filled with burning and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. Skipping to verse 17. For I am ready to fall and my pain is ever before me. I confess my iniquity. I am sorry for my sin. But my foes are vigorous. They are mighty and many are those who hate me wrongfully. Those who render me evil for good accuse me because I follow after good. I do not, uh, do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far off from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. Let's respond to this good, very emotive word from the psalmist. Let's respond to this by confessing our sin together. Pray with me, brothers and sisters. Let us confess to God the Lord, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. I, poor sinner, confess myself before God Almighty that I have gravely sinned by the transgression of his commandments, that I have done many things which I should have left undone, and I have left undone that which I should have done through unbelief and distrust in God and weakness of love toward my fellow servants. God knows the guilt I have incurred, for which I am grieved. Be gracious to me, Lord. Be merciful to me, a poor sinner. Amen. Come before God in a silent prayer of confession of sin. Amen. Uh, please stand as we hear from Ephesians 1, 2 through 10, God's declaration of pardon for us this morning. Hear now God's good word. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he has set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Amen. We respond to this good word singing together hymn number 167, When Morning Gilds the Sky.
may be seated and hold on to that Trinity hymnal and turn to page 875. Eight seventy-five, and we're going to be reading responsively uh, from the shorter catechism. Uh, we like to switch it up a little bit on uh, days where we're doing uh, when we're celebrating the Lord's Supper. Um, I'll read the question, and you can respond with the answer. Again, we'll be doing uh, Q and A eighty-two through eighty-five. Is any man able perfectly to keep the commandments of God? Are all transgressions of the law equally heinous? What does every sin deserve? Every sin deserves God's wrath and curse, both in this life and that which is to come. And what doth God require of us that we may escape his wrath and curse due to us for sin? Amen. It's a long one. It's a good one. Um, I just want to point out one quick thing. Notice that 83 are all sins equally heinous. The answer is no. No, they're not. Um, Sometimes we confuse this with what comes after it. What does every sin deserve? Every sin deserves the wrath of God. It's It's an important kind of theological distinction that comes into play in practical application in life all the time. But anyway, I thought I'd point that out to you. Our first scripture lesson is taken from Deuteronomy 16, verses 13 through 20. The Feast of Booths. You shall keep the Feast of Booths seven days, when you have gathered in the produce from your threshing floor and your winepress. You shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns. For seven days you shall keep the feast to the Lord your God at the place that the Lord will choose, because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all your work of your hands, so that you will be altogether joyful. Three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Booths. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. Justice. You shall appoint judges and officers in all your towns that the Lord your God is giving you, according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show impartiality, and you shall not accept a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and and subverts the cause of the righteous. Justice, and only justice, you shall follow that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
The second scripture lesson is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house in the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. The word of the Lord. Please turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 7. just a moment, we'll be reading from John 7, uh, verses 14, all the way through 31. So John 7, 14 to 31. But first, um, this morning, I want to talk about teachers. Um, everybody has teachers. Uh, you've probably had many in, in your life. And um, for some of us, maybe we were homeschooled, and maybe mom and dad were your primary teachers. Maybe that's the case. Or we went to public school or private school, whatever it may be. Um, but in life, we have many, many teachers. And we, we evaluate teachers from a very young age. I mean, I, I remember it. I remember th- you know, thinking about my teachers in, in kindergarten. And I think I, t- I called them you know, big hair and long hair because I couldn't remember their names. Um, but but, but I, would ev- I would evaluate teachers, and often I would evaluate them, um, well, you know, this one's a, a mean teacher, or this one's a nice teacher, or, you know, this one's a fun teacher, and this is how we kind of, at least initially, evaluate our teachers. It's not very sophisticated. This is true. Then, as we grow and we can remember our teachers' names, and we, we begin to, to perhaps develop a little bit as students, then we start to evaluate our teachers, maybe more so by, is this teacher engaging, right? It, not just that they give me information, but that they they help me to really interact with the information and they ask good questions and get me to think about it, right? And this is kind of how we start to appreciate teachers in a new way, at a different level. And then, and then, even beyond that, you start to develop your own opinions about things. As Christians, you start to develop your, your kind of your Christian worldview and your perspective and and that becomes the lens through which you view everything and then you start to evaluate your teachers a little differently you ask questions like well, where, where are they getting this information you ask about sources and and authority right behind that you you, you ask is what they're saying true not just interesting but is it true and even, even down the road from that, is it good? Right? Does it lead to something that is good, godly, good for my neighbor? Like all these kinds of questions. And here in our text today, Jesus, he stands up and once again, he's teaching publicly. And the people are responding and they're asking questions about this teacher, and they're evaluating Jesus and what he's saying. And while they're interested in Jesus, in part because he's so interesting, he's so engaging as a teacher, they're also confused. They're, they're, you know, this Jesus, he's not the student of some well-known rabbi. He, he's not you know, known to us in that way as far as, you know, where is this teaching coming from? Is this just kind of innovative stuff? Should, should we embrace what he's 
teaching us on what foundation does Jesus build his doctrine or his teaching that he's, that he's speaking here publicly in the text. So these, there's all kinds of questions about Jesus as a teacher this morning. So let's turn to the scriptures and, and read this section again. It's um, John 7, 14 through 31. Hear now the very word of God. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews, therefore, marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The crowds answered, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? And Jesus answered them, I did one work and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from, and when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, You know me, and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true. And him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? Let's pray. Our glorious God in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to come and to, to worship you. And as part of our worship, not all of it, there's so many elements of, of worship and all of them significant, but as this one central aspect of it, we hear your word read and we hear it proclaimed, Lord. We're so thankful for the great blessing that we can do this, Lord, that we have freedom and ability to do it. Uh, Lord, without fearing persecution, and Lord, we, we pray that that reality would not cause us to lose sight of how important this is, our worship gatherings. Uh, Lord, so many don't have this kind of, of privilege, this kind of opportunity to meet in this way in the world. Uh, but Lord, we pray that you would cause our hearts to appreciate and to enjoy to love the reading and preaching of your word. I pray, Lord, for wisdom to rightly divide the word of truth in a way that honors you and that is edifying uh, for the people of God. I pray in Christ's name, amen. Well, here Jesus is. He's preaching again in Jerusalem, openly, publicly. You'll remember from last time his half-brothers came to him and they wanted him to go up to Jerusalem uh, for the feast of booths or tabernacles. 
And he said to them, no, I'm, I'm not going to go, not when you want me to go, at least. I'm not going to go with you. I'm not going to go in the way that you want me to go. And we talked about why Jesus rebuked them last week. But then eventually he does go to Jerusalem and he, he hears people speaking, kind of hush-hush, but they're speaking about him. Where is this Jesus? Oh, I like him. He's a good man. Well, no, I think he's leading Israel astray from God and from our mission. He hears all of this, and then in the middle, somewhere in the middle of this seven-day feast, Jesus stands up in the temple, and he begins to teach openly, publicly, in front of everyone. Now, we don't know exactly what his teaching was, exactly, and yet, we, we know generally what Jesus would have been teaching as he stood up and he was teaching uh, publicly. Very, very likely, um, you can look at, for instance, Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, right? this extended sermon that we're given by Jesus. This is often in the scriptures, you know, Paul, there's extended sermons that were given by Paul. This is kind of representative of here's, here's the basic gist of what Paul would typically be teaching as he went and he taught publicly. In the same kind of way, Jesus probably was, was teaching a lot of similar things to, for instance, Matthew 5 through 7. And the response in Matthew uh, 7 to the Sermon on the Mount, the response of the people is actually very similar to what we see here in John 7. So in Matthew 7, 28 and 29, it says, when Jesus finished these sayings, the Sermon on the Mount, the crowds were astonished astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority. So here in John 7, they're, they're marveling at his teaching. They're, they're very much considering the same kind of issue, this issue of authority. They're confused as to how a man like Jesus can teach in this way, especially a man like Jesus, a, a man who had never studied, as I mentioned, under a renowned rabbi, right? So he's not just coming out and saying, you know, I'm the student of rabbi so-and-so, and my teaching is in, in line with this rabbi right, who's time-tested and everybody kind of trusts his authority, his teaching. Jesus isn't doing that. That's typically what would have been done with uh, a relatively young rabbi like, like Jesus, right? So Jesus, we could think of it this way, Jesus lacked the typical credentials of a well-known rabbi. He didn't, he didn't have the right degrees. We could think of it in that way. He didn't have the right credentials that would have caused the people to immediately trust kind of what he's saying, what he's doing. Maybe um, we could think in the Reformed community this way. We, we do this a lot, right? Pastors do this a lot. Teachers do this a lot um, within Reformed churches. And again, I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm going to continue doing this. I don't think this is wrong in and of itself, right? But um, often rabbis would do like what we do here. I'll, I'll quote from John Calvin, right? I'll, I'll quote from B.B. Warfield, right? This is, this is typical stuff for, for a pastor like me to do. And, and why do I do that? Well, yeah, part of it is they've got really good things to say, right? They've got good insights. But part of it is, well, you know, young pastor, it's nice to know who he's reading. It's, it's nice to know that, that this young guy isn't just, you know, uh, innovative in, in, his, in, in his teachings, that he's rooting himself within our reformed interpretation of Scripture, And so I think it's actually kind of helpful in some ways for that. But Jesus, he's not doing that. He's speaking in a different way that, as they said back in Matthew 7, 28 through 29, it seems like he's teaching as if the authority is his own authority, his own authority. So they're, they're questioning, how can Jesus teach this way? Is he an innovator? Is he leading us astray, right? Now, I would say that it's, it's probably not a terrible impulse uh, to be a little bit on edge 
when it comes to innovative teaching. Jesus' teaching wasn't really innovative. It was actually true to the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures. But I think it's actually a pretty good impulse. In fact, it, within our culture and within even the church culture, I kind of wish we had this. Instead of an addiction to innovation, an addiction to freshness and spontaneity and so-called authenticity, I actually think it can be kind of helpful to be a little bit wary of innovation. But that's just an aside. Um, now, Jesus here, uh, he answers their fears. He answers their concerns related to authority, relating to his credentials, we could say. So Jesus says in verse 16, look there, he says, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. How are we to understand that text? My teaching is not mine, but is, it belongs to the Father, is what he's saying, right? It belongs to the Father. Now, we, every once in a while, it's good to do this. Go back to John 1, the prologue. The prologue, if you're ever confused with what you're reading in John, what I've found very, very helpful is just go back to John 1. Go back to the prologue, which just means the first word, right? The prologue is just the first word. So the, the first 18 verses is kind of like the introduction to John, but it's this little key, this little interpretive grid, and it really helps, I think. So if you look at this, you put this into the context of John 1:18, which says that Jesus came to do what? To reveal who? The Father, right? Jesus came to reveal the Father to do from, we saw this in John 6 especially, to accomplish the will of the Father. Remember John 5, how uh, the Father and the Son are in perfect harmony is the language that we use. So much so that Jesus was able to say, remember this, whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. And not even Moses, not even David could have said that whatever the Father does, that's what the Son does. Remember that Jesus, when he was being accused back in, I believe it was back in chapter five, the end of chapter five, verse 30 and following, um, you remember he turned the tables. Well, you have accusations against me. I've got accusations against you. And you remember he said, there's all of these witnesses that attest to the fact that, yes, I'm the Christ. Yes, what I'm saying is true. And you're ignoring them. And he says, Moses and the scriptures himself, Jesus' self-testimony, but the very first witness who testifies to Christ and the validity of his ministry, you remember who it was? The Father. The Father. That's who it was. So when Jesus says, my teaching is not mine, but it's the Father's, you, you need to put that into kind of what we've been seeing in John 6 and 5 and all the way back to the prologue in John 1. He's come to reveal the Father. So Jesus then, in, in doing this, in some ways, I'm not sure it fully accomplishes it with this crowd, but he's, he's, he's trying to calm, in some ways, the concerns here, some legitimate concerns, as I've pointed out, the concerns that he's just some freewheeling innovator. He's not. Remember, he's come uh, not to abolish the law and the prophets, but what? To fulfill the law and the prophets. But then he does what I just mentioned he did elsewhere. He turns the tables. He, he goes more so on the, on the offensive and less on the defensive. He turns the, the table and he says that anyone who wants to do the will of the Father, of God, will recognize that Jesus' authority is legitimate. Meaning that if you understand the scriptures, you embrace the witnesses of scripture, if you do that rightly, you will embrace the teachings of Jesus. And then on the flip side, if you don't embrace the teachings of Jesus, what does Jesus say? It's because you're out for your own glory, not for the glory of God. And Jesus here is especially aiming at the religious leadership, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, 
right, who are out there and, and they're, they're emphasizing different parts of the scriptures, but Jesus is saying they're doing this in order to exalt themselves. They even use the scriptures, you remember, sometimes even to, to crush others, right? But, but what they're not really doing is they're not using the scriptures to exalt God. And because of that, they don't embrace Jesus. They don't embrace uh, uh, the, the one who reveals the Father, truly. But then Jesus kind of digs the, the accusation a little deeper. He twists the knife and, and he says, and I love that you all laughed because that's, that's what I did when I was reading. Um, Has not Moses given you the law? Right? Has not Moses, oh wait, that was the other one. Oh, we'll get to that. But this one I laughed too. Has not Moses given you the law? You, you, you have to love Jesus asking that to a group of Jews in Jerusalem, and we know that there are some of the representatives of Pharisees and, and scribes there. He says, has not Moses given you the law? Like, did he forget to give those things to you, those tablets? Did you forget? Did he forget to do that? He says, yet none of you keep the law. And he gives as a very specific example to that. He says, you're seeking to kill me, which the last time I checked, is against the law of Moses. You don't murder people. That's the sixth commandment. That's basic stuff. But then the crowd responds, right? Probably some representatives of the Pharisees, the religious establishment. They respond and they say, oh, no, no, nobody's seeking to kill you. You must be possessed by a demon. That's an evil accusation. How dare you even say such a thing? And Jesus I love it. He doesn't skip a, a beat. He doesn't miss a beat here. He does not go off, right, with that red herring. He, he sort of ignores that lie, and he just continues to build his case against them. He points back to that moment when they really started to want to kill him, which was when he healed the man uh, uh, by the pool of Bethesda in John 5. And he points back, and he, he says, you're, you're upset with me. You think, you think I was being blasphemous. And he says, but this is, it's hypocrisy. You allow for people to be circumcised on the Sabbath. You recognize that that's important to do, and yet you will not allow me to heal someone on the Sabbath day. Your judgment is seriously off, Jesus says. Well, They've lied, they've lied that they're, oh, we're not trying to, to kill you, right? As often happens when lies are publicly embraced by people in authority, the truth comes out eventually. Or at least the truth survives among the mutterings of the masses. And that's what happens here, right? That's verse 32, by the way. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering, muttering. So the truth it survives among the mutterings of the masses. And I love it. This was the one that you all laughed at. This was what I laughed at too. Verse 25, is not, this, is not this the man whom they seek to kill? I, I kind of view this, I know it's probably multiple people, but I kind of view this as the, the, the bumpkin from the country up in Galilee, right? Who's there uh, for the Feast of Booths, because this is one of the three pilgrim feasts where they would come throughout the year to Jerusalem. And, and you know, I just, I just like to think of, of him as just standing up and saying, no, no, I'm pretty sure you guys wanted to kill him. Like, I just heard that, just the other. But, you know, it's just the, the truth is alive and well, and it's continuing to spread, but Jesus somehow remains alive and he remains free they don't come and grab him and why is that because remember friends that god's will is such that if it's not time for you to die you will not die right your death the day of your death is appointed by god he's sovereign over the day of your death that was true of you, it's true of Jesus, too. And that's the justification that John gives. They didn't, they didn't grab him and arrest him and kill him right there and then. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. 
It wasn't his time to be arrested and killed. That hour would come, but not now, not now. They, they were bound. Yes, even these wicked men who would eventually put him to death, they were bound by the decree of God. They were not going to kill him in that moment. This has always been a sweet truth to the Christian throughout the ages that our death is in God's hands alone. And so we can trust in that. Well, the people, though, they're looking at this and they're thinking, well, why? Why, why aren't they grabbing him? Why aren't they killing him? Maybe they know something that we don't know. Maybe they really know that he is the Christ, or at least they're considering the possibility. But then many of them, they couldn't figure out, well, this doesn't kind of jive with our expectations of who the Messiah would be and all of this. But then you get to the end of our text. And I think that the Apostle John loves to write this. I I assume that John had a big smile on his face every time he wrote something like this because he writes it all the time, every opportunity that he gets, right? This is why he writes, so that they may believe. And so then you get to verse 31, yet many of the people believed in him. That's what brings John great joy. It should bring us great joy, shouldn't it? When we hear that somebody embraces Jesus, when they believe for the first time especially, but then continue and persevere in the faith, we should rejoice and we should have glad hearts and our our faces should light up as again, I believe John very likely did. Well, this brings us to some final uh, uh, reflections on our text. Um, what we could call applications or, uh, or uses of the text as, as some of the Puritans would often call it. So let's, let's look at three applications or uses of this text briefly this morning. So the first one, the first one is s- simply this, see the doctrine of the Trinity at work. Okay, see the doctrine of it. This is practical, I promise, Christian. You have to grow in the knowledge and understanding of the Lord. Uh, uh, the Trinity is who God is, so we have, to, we have to grow in this, right? You need to grow in your understanding of the Trinity. And I love this because, because in the scriptures, we get a, a living, breathing example of what, or a picture, or a window into what the Trinity is, who God is. Is right, so the three persons of the one God have always agreed to accomplish this great work of redemption. This has always been the case. Theologians call it the covenant of redemption from eternity past. God always knew He was going to do what He was going to do in redeeming a people to Himself, right? He always was in harmonious agreement about this, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Father didn't go to the cross, right? And the Spirit didn't go to the cross either. The Son incarnate went to the cross. And here we see that the Father sent forth his Son, and the Son reveals, he revealed the Father, right? And as an enfleshed, enfleshed, incarnate God man, he submitted to the Father's will the entire time, right? Entire time. And this, I think, kind of came in handy for Jesus as he was being asked about, you know, he, he looks like just a, a regular person. There was nothing about his outward appearance that would make anybody say, wow, that's definitely God incarnate. Right? It's kind of helpful in some ways that as he's on earth and he's ministering as the God man, he's able to point to the witness of the heavenly father. So here we see, and and I just think we always need to be doing this, right? The doctrine of the Trinity is true. This is absolutely what we should believe. It's in the creeds and the catechisms, and we can read about it in a systematic way in all of those documents. But you have to be able to then not just say what that is, but to see it in the text of scripture, to explain it in some ways from the text of scripture as well, right? Know the creeds and catechisms, absolutely. 
They'll help you understand the text, but you need to be able to see it in the text itself in that very earthy uh, textual way. So here in the text, we see the doctrine of the Trinity at work, we could say. Number two. Number two is a rebuke or a warning, we could say, against Christian intellectualism. All right, a, a warning or a rebuke against Christian intellectualism. What, how, why do I say this? Um, so Jesus is a unique case, obviously. He's the God-man. He's unique. This is true. But still, um, notice here, Jesus, he doesn't rely on the precedent of rabbinical teachings. He doesn't say, well, rabbi so-and-so said this, so I am on good grounds to say this. He doesn't rely on some of the, those more intellectual traditions and habits. Now, again, this is Jesus here, right? So, so we should be very careful that we don't say something like this. Well, see, I don't need to consult what other spirit-filled Christians throughout the thousands of years of church history have said. I just, who cares what they say? I, it's just me and the Bible. That's not what I'm advocating. I don't think that's a good practice, okay? Not, not at all, not at all. But we can here see a call to abandon Christian intellectualism. And what's that? It's that form of Christianity that makes theological speculation the litmus test of Christian maturity. If you haven't read all of John Calvin, then you're just not a mature Christian. Is that true? No. <laughs> no. Clearly, we need, we need this point, right, today? <laughs> But I, I've, known, I've known many Christians, many, many, many Christians who are far more mature in the faith than I, who have never read through John Calvin, who have read very few or, or maybe none, right, systematic theology textbooks. But you know what they have done? And it's often overlooked. It's often not seen as a big deal, but it's a big deal. You know what they have done? For decades and decades and decades, they, they made Sunday worship, morning and evening potentially, they made Sunday worship a non-negotiable. And they were there for decades. And, and they were in Sunday school, right? Christian education, Sunday school. They were there and they took advantage of just the life of the church, the discipling life of the church. They listened to the pastor who, who you know, probably read a lot of those books, but they listened to the pastor for decades and decades and decades. What were they doing? They were attending the means of grace, the means by which we grow in maturity, those primary means of the word of God read and preached and sung and prayed, right? And the sacraments and, and prayer and all of these. And, and what else? They, they then applied that. They read the Bible individually and they applied it to their family and they led their families well and they put their sins to death and they put on new habits of Christian living very slowly, two steps forward, five steps back, but they did it for decade and decade, and they battled, they fought the good fight of faith, and they, God was faithful by the power of his spirit. They grew in maturity and faithfulness to God, love of God and love of neighbor, and their maturity makes me look like a tiny pipsqueak and it's not, it's, it, it, you don't need to read those huge systematic theology textbooks. And it's, it's that kind of attitude that says you do need to, that I think is, is quite upsetting. Um, because again, what it does is it's, it substitutes godliness for theological astuteness. Those two things are not the same. We should never do that. Those two things are not the same. Godliness and theological astuteness, they're not the same thing. And we need to, especially in the Reformed community, we need to be very careful. And this is coming from a guy who I just set up my library in my, in my new home study, and I'm just looking at all these books that I finally got out of the boxes, and I'm loving it, right? I don't, so I'm not saying don't read your theology books. Again, not at all, right? But we need to be careful. Godliness and theological astuteness are not the same thing. So there's number two. Number three is uh, this. There's a call in this text to Christian judgment or discernment is another word you could use for it. A call to Christian judgment. So D.A. Carson, he, he wrote this. He said that we live, quote, 
in an age when Matthew 7, 1, do you know what that is? Judge not, lest ye be judged, right? We live in an age when Matthew 7, 1 has displaced John 3, 16, which we all know what that is, as the only verse in the Bible the man in the street is likely to know. I think he's dead on. I think he's spot on right there. That's exactly the case. The man on the street will know, judge not, lest ye be judged. We'll even know the King James of all things, right? right? Judge not. They'll know that before they know anymore, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave forth his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now we should, of course, still be preaching and knowing John 3, 16, right? Absolutely, especially because people don't know it on the street. But we also need to be ready to give an answer for when somebody says to us, well, you, you can't make judgments. The Bible says judge not. It says it right there in Matthew 7, 1. And so Christian, what does the Bible say about judging? What about being a judge? We need to know these texts in Scripture. We need to have a Christian understanding of discernment or judgment. What does Matthew 7, 1 really say, Christian? Right? Judge not, lest ye be judged, for what? The judgment that you use is going to be applied back to you. Right? And then he even, in the context, he uses the word hypocrites. Right? Hypocrites. He says, you're, 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 you're grasping at the speck in your brother's eye, but you fail to take that huge log out of your own eye. He's talking about judging wrongly. Specifically, he's talking about what? Double standards. He's talking about double standards in that text. That's clearly what he's saying. And the text also says to judge. Did you know that? Not only does it say, don't use hypocrites, don't use a double standard. But it also says that when you do, apply the standard first to yourself by taking the log out of your own eye, he says, he gives you permission, go ahead, and yes, then only then can you take the speck out of your brother's eye. By the way, you wouldn't have been able to see the speck rightly because there's a log in your eye. So you have to take that out first. If you're gonna judge rightly, you have to do that first. So apply the standard first to yourself and then and only then can you apply the standard to, uh, to someone else. So the text actually says no double standards and yes, judge, but only judge after you have applied the standard to yourself, to yourself. Then you take that text and that text no longer contradicts, but actually goes perfectly with verse 24 in John 7. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So in the context here of discerning theology, discerning teachings, right, discerning things, morality would certainly fall under this as well. In that context, right, Jesus is calling on them to judge with right judgment, using right standards and harmonize it with Matthew 7, applying the standard first to themselves. He even calls them on hypocrisy here, Right, doesn't he, when he says you're allowing for on the Sabbath people to be circumcised but not to be healed, right? So he's calling them out on that. So here we have a call, my friends, to right judgment, right discernment. And we need to be ready because the world is currently coming at us and saying you're not allowed to make judgments because Jesus said. And we need to be able to respond patiently, lovingly, but firmly and truthfully that's not what the Bible says. Jesus never said that. In fact, he told us how to judge, and he told us that we need to judge rightly, rightly, and not with double standards. Well, brothers and sisters, let's pray as we close. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this text that you have given to us. I, I pray, Lord, that your spirit, for the spirit alone can do this, would apply this to our hearts in such a way uh, that it forms us all the more into people who look more like Jesus, who act more like Jesus, who love what he loves and thinks our thoughts after him and, and whose lives reflect the patterns of Christian living. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
Let's stand together as we respond to the word of God preached. Hymn number 401, All Praise to Thee, My God, This Night. confess our, our faith together. This is from uh, a liturgy by Ocalampadius. I love his name, one of the best names of all the reformers, uh, Johannes Ocalampadius. Well, um, let me read the leader sec- part and then you can respond with the people section. Oh, my Christian brothers and sisters, as you have been called to God's table, let everyone think on this. Oh, almighty, merciful God, Here I am at your table, which is inaccessible to me because of human error. And yet I believe that your holy body and your holy blood are present in bread and wine. Moreover, I fully and wholeheartedly believe that you assumed body and blood in order to save Adam and all his descendants from eternal death. Also, I believe and do not doubt that your holy body is given up unto death for me, and that your blood has been shed for me. Also, my Lord and God, not doubting, I believe in your presence, because you desire to confirm your divine word. Amen. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Our great and glorious God, Lord, we thank you for another opportunity to bow our heads before you. Lord, submitting to your will in all things. And in many ways, that's, that's what prayer always is showing, that we are not God. We are not in control. You are God. You govern all your creatures and all their actions. Lord, we pray for our nation. Lord, we pray and lift it up 
to you and pray that you would, uh, Lord, uh, bring leaders who uh, do not know you to know you. If they're, if they're not saved, that they would be saved, that you would transform them and bring them, Lord, into your family. Uh, we pray, Lord, also that governors of our uh, nation, all those magistrates would do what you've called them to do, uh, Lord, in punishing evil and upholding the good, uh, what is good according to your, your word, for you are goodness. Uh, Lord, we pray also um, for, for those who, who need your help and, and assistance. Uh, Lord, we pray for um, Christopher and Ashley. Uh, Lord, we lift them up to you as they're going through these um, proceedings to adopt two young uh, siblings. And uh, we specifically, Lord, ask here, as Dave Essig has asked, we, we do ask for, for safety and protection, Lord, for them as uh, there are some issues there going on. We, we lift them up to you. You know all of the, the details, Lord, and we pray for, again, for protection, for safety, and we pray that, um, that you would bless Christopher and Ashley and these, these children and if it be your will, Lord, bring them together uh, into this family and uh, bless them and uh, bro bring those children, Lord, to you uh, through Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, we pray also for um, Dan and Linda, uh, as, as Julie has asked for us to, to pray. Uh, Lord, we, we pray for uh, Dan, who's battling a rare type of cancer, started up chemo recently uh, that's had some side effects and we pray lord that you'd strengthen his body and bring healing lord uh, through through medicines and through these means but also even without means by your supernatural power that you'd bring healing to his body um, lord we pray also for uh, for linda whose only son just passed away um, unexpectedly um, at 45 years old and Lord, we pray for them as they grieve. We pray, Lord, that they would come to you and cry out to you with their hurts and pains and would find great and unexplainable comfort in you, Lord, our triune God, who is a God of comfort and of love and of mercy and of, of encouragement. Uh, Lord, we, we give you thanks and, and praise uh, for uh, Dave Shaw's mother uh, recovering well uh, from her heart surgery. We're so thankful for how you uh, answered many prayers, um, Lord, for her uh, through, through that time, and we're, th we're thankful again for her recovery. Uh, Lord, we pray um, for uh, Kobe's uh, sister-in-law, Gertie, and we lift Gertie up to you. Uh, her shoulder has been hurting uh, for over a, a year um, after a fall, and she's scheduled for an operation on March 10th. Um, so we pray, Lord, for that operation that would be successful in your good providence. God, we pray for um, all, unex uh, all expected uh, mothers, all expectant mothers. Uh, Lord, we uh, pray for Brenna and for Kate and Hannah and Holly and Rachel. We pray, Lord, for, um, for, for these mothers, these expectant mothers, we pray for their bodies, Lord, that you'd strengthen them, uh, help them, Lord, as, as they're going through various changes. And we pray especially for the little ones uh, within them that, Lord, you would strengthen those little lives and protect them and preserve them throughout uh, that whole time of pregnancy. Uh, Lord, we uh, pray for... Um, as Val has asked for a good resolution, a good resolution to our um, uh, their, their neighbors' living situation, um, and we we pray for them. For years, um, uh, their their housing has been inadequate, and uh, so we pray, Lord, uh, for you to bless them greatly, and um, and give the Shaws wisdom as they seek to be good neighbors, uh, uh, Christian witnesses in that way. Uh, Lord, we um, pray uh, for the Rathbuns and we lift them up to you uh, for uh, a residence card in particular. 
Um, we pray for them and that they would, uh, uh, when they come back here and they're here for a year, that they won't be stuck here or have difficulties getting back. And we pray for their ministry and that it would be fruitful and that you provide, Lord, all of the resources, all of the funding, everything that they need. Uh, Lord, we pray um, thanking you for, um, for the Good News Club and for the ministry that it does. And we, we pray, Lord, for uh, fruitfulness for it for this semester. And, and we pray, Lord, that, that children would hear the gospel and that they would be uh, changed, transformed, made new creatures in Christ. Um, that they would know the, the peace and, and, and uh, uh, joy of, of, of being a Christian, of being in communion with you, our, our God. Uh, Lord, we pray uh, for Tim also and that you would strengthen him uh, for that task of organizing uh, those things as well and that he'd be able to have enough uh, volunteers that he needs. Uh, Lord, we pray um, uh, giving thanks, as, as Paul said uh, well earlier, um, Lord, you are in control of all things and you, you bring trials to us for our good, Lord, and so we pray that you would help us even in difficult, hard providences to, to receive those things in that way, um, and, and so we give you thanks, Lord, for that and thanks that things seem to be uh, going relatively well uh, with it. Uh, Lord, we um, pray also, uh, as, as Ralph has said, for Ralph's daughter uh, and, and family. Uh, she's due soon, so we pray, Lord, for safe delivery, and we're thankful, Lord, again, for new, for new life. Um, and we pray, uh, Lord, also for that family. Uh, also, um, their, uh, her father-in-law, uh, who's still uh, in the hospital, uh, we lift him up to you also for healing. Uh, Lord, we pray for Andrew. We continue to pray and lift him up to you. Uh, we pray that you draw him near to yourself. And also we pray specifically for uh, this, uh, this surgery on his shoulder, that it would be a successful uh, procedure. We pray, Lord, thanking you that uh, Gordy and Lisa are, are doing well, that their, their house is still standing. And Lord, that in your providence, um, it, it wasn't worse than, than it was. And so we, we pray, Lord, thanking you for, for their safety. Uh, we also lift up this abortion ministry that was mentioned, and we pray that you'd bless it. Um, abortion is this great, massive stain on, on our nation. And uh, Lord, we pray against it, and we pray that you would uh, uh, deliver us from it and help our, our leaders to see it for what it is as a great moral evil. Um, and Lord, we also pray that Christians would not only be calling prophetically, calling the government to, uh, to repent, but also coming alongside those who have bought into lies uh, that the, the culture tells them about abortion and that we would uh, be ministering mercy and grace uh, to uh, to men and women uh, and children who have been affected by, by the great sin of abortion. Uh, Lord, we uh, thank you for, for ministries that, uh, that serve people like that. Uh, Lord, we come to you uh, praying in the very same way that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the line is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Amen. Uh, you may be seated. In that uh, confession of faith that we read, again, Occulum Potius is his name who wrote this. He says, um, Also I believe and do not doubt that your holy body was given up unto death for me, and that your blood has been shed for me, also my Lord and God, not doubting. I believe in your presence because you, you desire to confirm your divine word. Um, what makes this time so powerful and unique is, yes, we, we remember what the Lord Jesus has done for us in dying for us and being raised for us. Yes, this is true, but also there is a unique power in this, this token of the covenant because God is, Christ is present in a way that is quite mysterious to me, but he is present nonetheless, confirming his promises to us. I will be with you until the end of the age. And so we're thankful because in this meal we commune with our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Because we believe that this meal is so powerful and significant, that it's given as a token of the covenant to the covenant people, we hear then Paul's words who warns us to not partake of this meal if this meal is not for you. And so he says this, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. With these words in mind, if you... If you are a professing believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you say, Jesus is my Savior. He died for my sins to atone for, to cover my sins. He, he took the penalty that my sin deserved, every sin deserving of God's wrath and penalty and, and God's just to, to do that. He's God. He's just, right? He took the penalty, Jesus, on his back so that I wouldn't have to. If you say with, with glee, with joy in your heart, yes and amen, that's what I believe. And you have united yourself in, in this public kind of way. You've united yourself to a believing community, a church like this one. It doesn't have to be this particular one, but to the church of Christ, a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church then this meal, my friends, it's for you. And even if you're discouraged, even if you're feeling weak in the faith, that doesn't mean that you should not partake. It means that you need to partake. You need the encouragement and the strengthening, the spiritual strengthening of this meal. So please, weak Christian, you too, take part in this meal and be strengthened in it by the power of the Spirit. Let's pray to that end. Our great and glorious God, we pray over these elements, ordinary bread, ordinary wine, but Lord, nonetheless, we pray that you'd set them apart for this extraordinary and amazing thing that we get to do together in celebrating this sacrament of the Lord's Supper. We pray that you would indeed bring Christ to mind in remembrance of him, specifically of his crucifixion and his resurrection, but also, Lord, we pray also that your spirit would powerfully be forming us and reforming us into people who look more like Jesus, strengthening and encouraging the weak, Lord, and humbling the proud. And Lord, we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And after he had given thanks for the bread, he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're going to be dispensing uh, the elements as we have been, so you'll come forward and, uh, and take part and go out. Is that correct or the opposite? No, you'll come out and you'll go up the aisle back to your seats. Beloved Church of God, take and eat. The blood of the new covenant, take and drink. Heavenly Father, you are good to meet with us in this way. Uh, We thank you, Lord, for the intimacy in many ways of of this sacrament. We come close together. We eat uh, of the same bread. We we drink of the same cup. And so, Lord, we're, we're thankful, Lord, for that. It reminds us that we are bound together, Lord, by 
our union with Christ, our faith in him. We, we have the one faith. We worship the one God. And so we're thankful, Lord, for the unity of our, of our fellowship, even, even this local expression of that at, at Christ Presbyterian Church. We're thankful, Lord, for it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing Amazing Grace, hymn number 460. go out from this place, receive the blessing of our God. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace.